at Wheeling High School. So delighted to see so many of you out. I would like to introduce my colleagues uh, that are with us tonight, and this is kind of a tradition we do at our college events. Uh, we have with us Ms. Diane Bourne from Prospect, Ms. Nancy Davis. They like you, Diane. Yes. Nan now we got to compete. Who's going to get the loudest clap? Nancy Davis, Ms. Nancy Davis from Hersey. Mr. Robert Yurkan from Host Rolling Meadows. Mr. Paul Genovese from Elk Grove High School. And here in spirit, but not in person, Ms. Kathy Fox from Buffalo Grove. Uh, also, after the presentation, uh, just to announce, I will stay for individual questions. And there tend to be a lot of those. Or you can just make an appointment or call your college counselor in your building. But I will stay for individual questions. We also have another resource. Ms. Crystal Ramirez is here with us tonight from the Illinois Student Assistance Commission. Crystal, thank you for being here. That is the state organization that if the General Assembly and governor can shake hands and get along, will provide state financial aid for you. Uh, at this very moment, of course, we're not getting along. So, but we are optimistic that that will be resolved soon. So this is an event timed for juniors to learn about the financial aid process. And I would like to get a sense of experience. How many of you have done the financial aid application before? How many are experienced financial aid people? How many aren't? I think the irons won, don't you? The irons won. So that's why you're here tonight and why I'm here. And while I will mention changes that have occurred, I'm not going to really focus on those changes because most of you haven't done it before. You will hear some, not to worry about that. So this is our District 214 Annual Financial Aid Night. As I look at the audience, especially those that raised their hand that haven't done this before, I see people whose faces remind me of how I look when I'm in the dentist's waiting room. <laughs> we, we do want to reduce anxiety tonight. That is one of our goals. And we'll talk many ways about how we can do that. But I want to reassure you, the FAFSA is not impossible to do. After the first year, the first year might take you an hour, an hour and a half. After the first year, you'll get it done in a half hour. It is not impossible. Now, I'm hearing some laughter, so maybe those that did raise their hand to they've done it before saying, are you nuts? I've done about 1,000 FAFSAs, maybe more, in my role as college counselor. It does get easier as you get familiar with it. So we're not, just, we're not talking about nuts and bolts of completing a form tonight, as much as we are how financial aid works. And by nature, financial aid is personal and private, which means this presentation has to be a general presentation. It will not cover every possible special circumstance. I apologize, but if I tried to cover every special circumstance, we would be here at midnight. And none of us want to do that. So our philosophy in part is to reduce anxiety. We do not want college to be the best seven years of your son or daughter's life. We want them in and out in four years. And that's one of the, the key things about saving money and making this affordable. Do what it takes to graduate in four years. A fifth or sixth year means more expense and a loss of income in those years. So that, that is our target and our goal, always to try to to try to graduate in four years. I also want to talk about financial aid officers a little bit. You see the picture of the financial aid officer at some Midwestern university. Not really. They don't look like that. I, I tend to, to easily demonize people if they don't give me what they want. I make them demons. These are really human beings who got into financial aid to help students get as much money as they can following the rules. So this is kind of a commercial for all my college financial aid people is, is to remember they are human and they will work with you to the best of their ability. So 
So again, the, the reducing anxiety. How do we do that with, with college and particularly tonight financial aid? I get nervous if, if I have to do something and I'm really ignorant about it. I don't have any knowledge about it. That makes me nervous. And if it makes you nervous, gaining the knowledge like being here tonight is going to help. Knowing the rules, knowing some tricks of the trade will help you. Having conversations with your college counselor in the family. That family co component is critical. Money can be a very hot topic. God knows it was in my family when my kids were in college. So, but, but trying to remain calm and just talking about the pros and cons. And then financial op options, which I will uh, provide some, some of them this evening. Of course, picking a college is broader than just paying for it. The goal in picking the ideal college for your son or daughter is to match them, that unique individual, with an institution. And to do that, you identify what's important and then match the, those values that you have with specific colleges. And the values uh, fall into four areas for college selection. You can see them on the screen. If you haven't figured out already, I don't read everything on a slide. I'll try to highlight it. You can read. I know you can all read. Plus, you have the handout. But when we do matching services for our students, we look at the programs the school offers, the kind of people that like that campus, the location, and then the price. And of course, tonight, that's our focus. So we're not talking about the other three. I just want to do the commercial that they are out there. This is the agenda for the remainder of the presentation. And we will take them one at a time. There is some good news and there is some bad news. First, the bad news. So the, the uh, graph that you see represents the current total costs, direct costs of our uh, three schools that are popular in the Northwest suburbs, Northern Illinois, DePaul, and Northwestern. The top is the anticipated cost five or six years from now. Most colleges go up every year. Our state of Illinois, some of our schools try to lock in tuition, a, a four-year tuition guarantee. But fees can go up, and room and board can go up. And if you buy books at the bookstore, which I don't recommend, we'll talk more about that later, uh, those go up as well. So th that's the harsh reality. Pretty much everything else we talk about is going to be better news. But it's good to get the, the devil out there in front of us. So college admission people like to say if you spread out the payments for college, that it's more affordable. And literally, the, the concept is you pay for college for your children from their birth to age 30. <laughs> Imagine that. But if you spread it out over 30 years, the payments are pretty low. The overall cost may be higher if you're doing it at the tail end. And so I'll show you what I mean. Some of us are fortunate enough to be able to save when our kids were small. We've had a nest egg built up, and that money is there for us to use. Some of us weren't that fortunate, aren't that fortunate. I fall into that latter category. I, I did not save. I made direct payments. And even though my kids are all in their late 20s, I am still making parent loan payments that I took out. I teased my wife when I was talking about tonight. I teased her and said, I'm going to be paying off those kids' loans from the grave. It's going to take me a while. So if you are fortunate enough to save early, you, you, would, you probably don't have that dilemma. If not, you may be taking loans out. And that's where choosing a school carefully really gets important. So you stay within a preset budget. And that's where the conversation with the family becomes important as well. So how can you save on costs for college? You can see some opportunities up on the screen. Here's a real cool way to save about $2,000 over four years. Don't buy books at the college bookstore. Go online and Google college textbooks 
online. And the, the discounts are huge. They may be used, but if you know you got the right book, I saw one that was list price $227 at the bookstore for $28. That's the kind of savings you can get, serious savings. You see the other ones. We're pushing, of course, the power of 15 in our district, the classes that Harper grants dual credit. That is transferable credit. We believe it's transferable to most colleges, certainly in the Midwest. And you can get a bachelor's degree if you're willing to commute from home and do two years at Harper College and two years at Northeastern Illinois, our state university on the northwest side. Four years at a cost of approximately $34,000, tuition and fees for four years. It doesn't get any more affordable than that without scholarships and significant financial aid. I had a student tell me last week that uh, he was doing his housing contract and meal plan, and he said, uh, you know, I, I'm going to get 21 meals. So I want three meals a day, seven days a week. And then I asked him, you know, are you going to come home on weekends? And he said, a lot of weekends. Yeah, I got a job. I might keep part-time. And do, do you, are you a morning person? No, I sleep till 10 or 11 o'clock. No, he's, gonna, he's going to basically pay for 21 meals and only consume around 10 to 12. So you, you shop for the meal plan. That can lower our cost. And you can see the others. Our scholarship sources come through our college counseling offices, and we list our scholarships on the Family Connection website that all District 214 students have access to. And you can get access if you ask your college counselor. There are a ton of webs. If you, if you Google financial aid, you'll get like 17 bazillion hits, right? And the first 10 are, are commercials, they're ads. So we've taken some, some of the best links for financial aid information. They are up on the screen. And there are more, if you, if you log in or your child shows you how to log into Family Connection, there are more great links there. There's also a lot of inf in misinformation about college on the web, and there's a lot of um, what I like to call financial aid vultures that will trick you into believing you must get their services in order to get to financial aid. And that comes with a price. It comes with a price. So be a very smart consumer with this. There used to be, I'll, I'll, I'm jumping ahead, talk about the facts in a minute. So we're talking about ripoffs. You need to be careful. If you get chosen or especially selected or you've been scheduled for an interview, or come to this free seminar that is not sponsored by an educational institution, it's going to be a sales pitch. It may not appear to be that, but that's in fact what it is. And you need to be really cautious. So here's a great example. Student Google FAFSA, and they got this site. And they actually did most of their FAFSA on the site. And then they came to my office and said, I need help with my FAFSA. And so I tried to log in the real FAFSA site and couldn't do it. And then they told me it doesn't look like that. It, it looks like this. It's got this name. So this, that was a company that would do a FAFSAs for $80 to $100. So it's FAFSA.gov is the website. That's it. Or it'll also, you'll also get there FAFSA.ed for education.gov, either one. So we're going to talk about some terms now. And the more you can use these terms comfortably, the more impressed you will be to a college financial aid officer. And if you can impress a college financial aid officer with your knowledge, they are more likely to try to work with you. So I encourage you and your child to learn these. Two kinds of money for college. Merit-based scholarships, you get it because you're good at something. Or you have a personal attribute that a college values. And need doesn't look at that personal attribute. It looks at how much money you have and your ability to pay. People who demonstrate financial need. More terms. We all like presents, gifts. Gift aid is the best. Gift aid, scholarships, grants. You don't repay them. Self-help is harder. To, to appreciate, but it sometimes is necessary. 
campus employment, federal work study jobs, and student loans. And I left parent loans out because I want to emphasize student loans are the better deal than parent loans. So gift self-help. There's no guesswork to determining how much financial aid you can get. I have a crystal ball in my office. I've had it for 20 some years. It doesn't work. Okay, so we, we use a formula that's a standard base formula for all colleges. All colleges start with this, particularly for any federal and state aid. So we're gonna spend a couple minutes talking about the, that simple formula. Again, you wanna impress a college uh, financial aid officer, Tell them, well, my EFC is $2,000, your cost of attendance is twenty-five. dollars are you going to give me $23,000 in financial aid? You're throwing those terms around that they use all the time. So they know you are an educated consumer and that you have choices for other colleges. COA, what it costs to attend. EFC, your expected family contribution, that's the key number I'm going to talk about tonight, and you're going to actually, if you want, when you get home, you can actually find out what your EFC is likely to be. So we subtract EFC from COA, we subtract expected family contribution from cost of attendance. What's left is your financial need eligibility, demonstrated financial need. I wish I could promise you you would get every penny. I can't promise that. There's only about 3% of colleges in the United States that have enough money to guarantee you will get every penny that you're eligible for. The other 97% will do the best they can, but may not meet all of your financial need. So how does that EFC come about? Where does it come from? So we're going a little deeper into the formula. Uh, your, congratulations. You are the first in the history of financial aid, the first group that gets to do their financial aid applications early. Financial aid opens up October 1st. This is one of the changes. Those that have done it before, in your mind, in my mind as a college counselor, you can't do a financial aid form till January 1st. Forget January 1st. It's been moved up by the government three months. That means your children, your, your sons and daughters, will be doing their college applications at the same time as you're doing your financial aid application. And it, this makes a lot of sense, this move up. You won't have to find a paper copy of your income tax or find out where you, where you stored a PDF on a computer. You'll be able to download it automatically from the IRS website while you're completing a FAFSA. So we're doing this in October, but you can see what, what's looked at and what's lowered. That living allowance, by the way, is based on the size of the family and the age of the parents. This is the first part of how your expected family contribution is established. The second part is your assets. But wait, not all assets. So retirement isn't used. Home equity, where you live, if you have equity in your home, is not used. And again, based on your age and the size of the family, there's a percentage of your assets that will be considered available to help pay for college. So this is the second piece, the parent assets. Third piece, if there's students here, it's your turn. They will look at your income for 2015 and your savings. You can do the same thing. If you did your taxes, as students, you, you won't have to find it and hand enter the numbers. The FAFSA, the financial aid application, will do that for you. Link to the IRS website. So we add parents' contribution from income, assets, and student contribution and we get the expected family contribution. Here in more detail is what's included and what's not. And you can see that on your handout, so I'm not gonna go through them. But know that no retirement assets are used, none. This is the summary for the formula that we just reviewed.
and this is plugged in again to that basic COA minus EFC equals demonstrated financial need. So tonight when we're done and you go home, if you're willing to spend 15 minutes, even if you haven't done your 2015 taxes yet, you probably have an estimate in your mind of your income. You go to this website, it is the FAFSA.gov website. You'll scroll down till you see the FAFSA forecaster. You put no personal information in this. You do put numbers, but no social securities or names or anything like that is used. It's very simple. It's hard to make a mistake because it won't let you go on if you put a, a, a value in or an answer in that doesn't fit. And there's about 18 questions. And what you get at the end is your expected family contribution, that key number. And you can start comparing that to different schools that you might have been thinking about. If you want to do that at a specific school site, you can do that as well. So the forecaster is general for all federal and state aid. But because of a federal law passed about four years ago and slowly uh, implemented. Every college in the country has what they call a net price calculator. And it's specific for that college. So they'll put in their cost of attendance. And you'll answer the same questions that the FAFSA forecaster asks. You'll also put in academic information, ACT and GPA, and maybe probable major. And not only will they tell you what federal and state financial aid you're eligible for, they will tell you what institutional financial aid you're available, that is available to you and scholarships based on grades and ACT. So the, the term is net price calculator. It's up there on the screen. The best way to find it is go to the college's homepage and there's always a search bar on a college homepage. Type in those three words exactly, net price calculator, and it should bring you, it should be the first or second hit on every school's website. Uh, next, we're going to do three sample financial aid packages. So imagine the financial aid officer, that guy hunched over all those bills, dollar bills in the beginning. Imagine him wearing really baggy pants with about 14, 16 pockets, big baggy pockets, and each one is filled with cash. And when the college packages, they reach into different pockets based on the rules, and they take out the amount of cash they can give you from that pocket. That's called a financial aid package. It comes about four to six weeks after your FAFSA has been successfully processed. Our first example is a high-need family. This family has an EFC of zero. They may have an income of $30,000 or 35000 or less. So they apply to a college. The college likes the student, wants them to attend. This is what a financial aid package looks like. They'll say, here's your, G, uh, your COA, here's your EFC, here's what we're going to give you. And what I want you to notice is the white at the bottom of the screen, the gap. There is no gap. Gap is the difference between what you're eligible for and what you get. This is a great financial aid package because there is no gap. The student was fortunate. Middle class family. And by the way, we, if you are in the middle class like I am, we have the toughest time paying for college. That's why I'm paying my kids' loans off from the grave. 46.6, now we have a $9,000 expected family contribution. And you can see how much need this family has. And you can see that they've lost eligibility for the Pell, SEOG, and MAP. And there is a gap. And that gap, the difference between what they get and what they're eligible for is 10600 
so the challenge for this family at this school is all right, we already got to come up with 9,000. That's my expected family contribution. Now they're saying I have to come up with another 10,600. What are they, crazy? And what the colleges will often say to you is, well, there's this thing called a parent loan, a plus loan. You can borrow the money and pay it back over time. That's where the family conversation has to happen. Is this school important enough to go into debt as a parent besides the student borrowing money. This is, a, this is an often a middle class family financial aid package. And those that have low need, high income. Same kind of example, COA minus EFC equals demonstrated financial need. Again, you see a gap. However, this family, if they have a $22,000 expected family contribution, is likely to have some resources they can draw on. It may not be easy, but they have more option than a middle class family does. We did high need, we did medium need, we did low need. The financial aid award letter is like that financial aid officer pulling out cash from different pockets. So at the time next year, actually it's not next year, I'm, my mindset is still you do the FAFSA in January or February. So this is now, you're, around Christmas time, you're going to have the results from the FAFSA. I don't know if that's a good thing or bad thing. So I'm just thinking about that. If you celebrate Christmas, you know, on Christmas Eve you might get a financial aid award letter from a college and look at it and, well, there goes my Christmas, right? But to evaluate it, is there a big gap, a difference between what you're eligible for and what you get? And how much is gift aid? If a college says, we're going to meet all your financial need, but parents will have to take out a $20,000 plus loan a year, that's a bad financial aid package. Because that's self-help money. You're looking for 70% gift to 30% self-help. That's what you want. That's the ideal. What a lot of us do now, which we will do next year in January, December and January, is to help students evaluate and compare financial aid awards. And students will come to us with these letters or with emails from the colleges, and we're going to help them crunch the numbers. And of course, if you are there, that's really beneficial because you're the key player. For mo in, in most cases, you are the key player in what's affordable. I'm going back to conversations with the family. I can tell you that most private schools are very generous with financial aid and scholarships to the best of their ability. I can also tell you that the stronger the student, the more likely they are to get more gift aid. That's the way a college tries to attract the students that they value the most. But dollar for dollar, most aid given is based on financial need. It's not based on merit. Still, many of our graduates get merit aid. A lot of merit aid. We look at where you're going to get a lot of dollars. And you'll, you'll hear a lot of conversations saying, you know, don't, don't eliminate private schools. They might give you enough of their own money to make it equal to a co the cost of a state school. And that is true. You won't know that for sure until you do financial aid uh, application, the FAFSA, and then get the results back from the college. In general, there's exceptions to everything, but in general, the hardest schools to afford if you are dependent on need-based financial aid, are out-of-state publics. I'll talk about the exceptions in a minute. But you look at schools like the University of Wisconsin at Madison, Purdue, Indiana, Michigan, places like that. They don't have a lot of money for most students. If you get government money, that helps to pay, but you have a higher cost, those schools, and you have less financial aid, typically. So if you're pursuing an out-of-state public like that, the big flagship university,